There we go. Greetings. I'm Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Human Development Institute's first spring seminar. My brief visual description is I am a white male wearing glasses with hazel eyes and a blue shirt with a blue and gray striped tie. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am sitting in front of a virtual background. My virtual background is a three-story brick academic building that has offices for the Human Development Institute on the University of Kentucky campus. The sun is shining on the brick building. We welcome all the participants who are joining us today. Our speakers will provide an opportunity for questions today, and we welcome questions from all of our participants. We have live captioning for this in the closed captioning feature. Turn on the captioning by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then clicking show subtitles. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Again, that is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation. You will receive an email that provides a link to access the session evaluation. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming seminars. The title of the seminar is Disability Pride. What's in a name? It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce our moderator and panelists today. Andy Imperato has been working in disability policy and advocacy inside and outside government for more than three decades. He currently leads Disability Rights California, a 40, 40, $44 million dollar legal services and policy advocacy organization based in Sacramento. His perspective is informed by his lived experience with bipolar disorder, and he encourages people with non-apparent disabilities to develop disability pride and be out and open at work and in other settings wherever possible. John Cheetah is the executive director of the Association of University Centers on Disabilities and has spent his career at the intersection of disability policy and research. He has also held leadership roles at the state and federal government level, most recently as an appointee in the Obama administration. He has lived with a spinal cord injury since 1993. Keith Hosey has been involved in disability advocacy for 19 years. He is a certified ADA trainer through the Southeast ADA Center. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Center for Accessible Living, Build Inclusion, and the Kentucky Assistive Technology Loan Corporation. Carissa Johnson is the Satellite Office Manager for the Center for Accessible Living in Murray, Kentucky. Carissa is a certified social worker with a master's in social work from Western Kentucky University. Carissa is the 2017 recipient of the National Independent Living Council Region for Advocacy Award. Carissa lives in Murray, Kentucky with her husband, Ben, and their son, Will. Bev Harp is Project Director for Innovative Supports for Autistic Workers, a project of the Human Development Institute and is a self-advocate faculty for LEND at the University of Kentucky. Bev is an autistic self-advocate who has presented at national conferences for APSI, AHEAD, TASH, and many other organizations. She holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Kentucky. Morgan Turner is a program education assistant at the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. He is a influential leader and expert peer educator. He works full time across multiple HDI projects focused on health, advocacy, leadership, and inclusive higher education and employment for people with disabilities. Morgan has co-facilitated several inclusive health, pro health promotion programs and over 75 trainings on universal design in health and disability inclusion for professionals, self-advocates, and community members. I'm now gonna turn it over to our moderator, Andy Imperato. Thank you so much, Walt. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. So I'm Andy Imperato, pronouns are he, him. I am wearing a green jacket that says Disability Rights California on it. And then I've got a, a blue shirt on underneath that says disability is not a bad word. And it says disability a bunch of times on the shirt. I'm, I'm at a rare appearance in my office in Sacramento. I, I normally work from home. So it's good to have an excuse to come in today. 
And i um, really grateful to Kathy Shepard Jones and the team at the Human Development Institute for inviting me to be part of this panel. So this is gonna be fun and informal. This topic is inherently personal. So I encourage the panel members to feel free to answer or not answer questions as you see fit. Um, I, I personally like the topic of disability pride in part because um, I feel like as a civil rights movement, uh, if all the people who are protected by laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act were out and open with our disabilities at work and in other settings, the progress that we would make as a movement would happen faster. Most, most people who are protected by civil rights laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act have disabilities like mine that are not apparent. I have bipolar disorder or manic depression. You can't tell that from looking at me. Sometimes if you spend enough time with me, you can pick up on it, but it's not the kind of thing that um, people will know about naturally if I don't talk about it. And um, as a professional, you know, working as a lawyer, I didn't necessarily get a lot of encouragement from other professionals to be out and open with my disability. That encouragement for me came from my peers who had disabilities and who the lawyers would think of as a client community. And uh, I, I have found that I've benefited a lot personally and professionally from being out and open with my disability. So Walt already uh, introduced folks, but let me just see if folks uh, wanna give a little bit of a visual description of yourselves and say anything that you wanna say beyond what Walt already said to introduce you related to kind of why this topic interested you and why you wanted to be part of this panel. Um, so maybe I'll start with my former colleague, John Cheetah from AUCD. And John, I can't tell, are you coming in from the actual office today? Uh, I am not. I'm at uh, the AUCD South office at my home in Alexandria, Virginia. So. Sounds good. Thanks, Andy. Uh, additional things about myself and why I wanted to participate in this group. Uh, first of all, I am a uh, middle-aged uh, white gentleman with graying hair. Uh, what used to be a salt and pepper beard is now much more uh, on the salt side, wearing uh, rimmed glasses, a gray turtleneck, and blue sweater. It is a little chilly here in, uh, in Alexandria. Uh, there's a lot of mythology about people with disabilities and a lot that even our colleagues without disabilities in the disability uh, community uh, don't necessarily know. And, and it's not necessarily things that we talk about often. So I, I think I'm, I'm here not to necessarily be a myth buster, but, but to round out uh, the disability experience uh, to say that there can be ownership of disability uh, that we all can be proud of. Uh, there is an inherent resilience and problem-solving nature that lives within all of us with disabilities. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But we also lead rich and full lives. I am a husband. I'm a father. I own my own home, and I can't tell you the number of times I've been asked, usually by medical professionals, which uh, group home I live in. So there are assumptions that people make about people with disabilities. And I would say that's true of those of us with disabilities about others in the disability community as well who don't necessarily share our unique disabilities. I am a wheelchair user, uh, paralyzed from the chest down, uh, have very uh, limited arm movement and finger function and require help to get out of bed in the morning every day in order to do the things I do in the world. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks to the University of Kentucky for hosting this conversation and to Andy for moderating. Thank you, John. And I, I can attest that you also move dangerously fast in your wheelchair, which fit, fits well with your last name of Cheetah. So uh, now I will move over to Morgan Turner. Morgan, anything you want to add? Yeah. Hi, my name is Morgan Turner. I'm a program education assistant at the Human Development Institute. I 
am a Special Olympics athlete, athlete ambassador and health messenger. And I'm a biracial male wearing a uh, blue, blue uh, pullover. Um, but yeah, I was born with hydrocephalus, which affects how I process things. Abnormal legs, so I wear prosthetics on both legs and abnormal left hand. So I have three fingers on my left hand. And that's about it about me. Sounds good. Uh, Bev, do you want to go? Hi, I'm Bev Harp. I'm a 60-ish white woman with very short white hair and glasses. And I'm wearing an Argyle sweater vest. I'm autistic. People don't always listen well to people with disabilities. Um, they might take our points under consideration, but still think that our demands for equity are quaint or impractical. But people do like positivity and pride sounds like a very positive word. So I knew this would be well attended. I want to highlight the other side of it. The reasons why the concept of disability pride is necessary in the first place. And that's what I want to talk about today. Great, welcome, Bev. Uh, Carissa. We got to unmute you. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I had a little trouble there. Sorry. My name is Carissa Johnson. My pronouns are she, her. I am a 40 ish. Uh, year old woman, white female, with uh, purple glasses and purple teal and pink hair. I love saying that in description every time. I'm wearing a black shirt and a gray sweater and sitting in my office. I'm in my background at work. So I jumped at the chance to uh, do this seminar because I've had some recent topics here at the Center for Accessible Living with consumers uh, where they don't feel like disability and pride go together. And I want to highlight the fact that you can be proud and also be frustrated. Those, those two feelings can go together and are okay. Um, I am a wife. I am a mother. I'm an advocate. I'm so much more than my disability itself. So I'm very happy to be here. Great, thank you, Carissa. Keith. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Hosey, he, him. I am a bald 40-something uh, white male. Um, I have more pepper than salt right now in my beard, but it's slowly changing, John. Um, and uh, I have a uh, checkered shirt on and my background is uh, the disability pride flag, uh, the second version of it, um, which is a, a black background with green, blue, white, yellow, and red lines diagonal through it. Um, I was born with club feet uh, as a result of that condition and uh, some childhood surgeries. I live with chronic pain. Um, in my 30s, I was also diagnosed with major depression and anxiety. So um, I'm living with uh, both physical and uh, psychiatric disabilities. And um, the reason I was excited to be on here, other than the fact that Andy's on here, um, is that, uh, like Carissa said, I, I think there are too many people that don't think the words disability and pride should go together. Um, and I think there are way too many people with disabilities who think that. So. Um, I, I, I too believe in um, us showing up as our whole selves everywhere we go. Um, and, and I hope more of uh, our friends and brothers and sisters with disabilities uh, can show up as their authentic selves. Um, and, and the other reason that this topic really speaks to me um, is because I, I feel like disability pride in and of itself is an act of civil disobedience. Um, I, you know, what does society tell us that something's wrong with us, right? We should be quiet and complacent, grateful for what we get as people with disabilities. Um, what is the opposite of pride, right? The word shame. 
Um, and, and that's what society, greater society over many years have wanted, uh, have, have pushed on us. And I, I think pride uh, in the act itself is, uh, is speaking to that power structure. Great, thank you, Keith. So um, we have a kind of a set of questions that I distributed to the panel members. Um, we are, we're definitely gonna uh, have a, a point where we can take questions from the audience. I encourage folks to post questions in the chat um, and I may kind of bounce around uh, between the prepared questions and things that come up in the chat. But the, the first question uh, is really an opportunity for folks to highlight most of us that have disabilities have good and bad things, good and bad experiences connected to our disabilities, sometimes things that other people don't realize or wouldn't think of. So I thought it might be fun to start by just asking each panel member to describe an aspect of your disability that gives you advantages over people that don't have your disability, at least in certain situations. Does anybody want to go first on that? You can either unmute or raise your hand, whatever whatever you're coming with. John, are you, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. So I've, I've got a mobility impairment, and uh, you know that that can come with rock star parking, depending on the venue, and uh, and great seating at uh, at concerts as well. Now, advantages is kind of a loaded word. I, I would say accommodations rather than advantages, uh, which which certainly applies not just to individuals with mobility impairments. But my, my favorite concert venue, the Birchmere here in Alexandria, it's a couple of miles away. And uh, if you have a disability, mobility impairment or not, uh, if you identify as having a disability, you get seated before the rest of the folks go into the concert hall. It's a general admission uh, scrum uh, as soon as the doors open. So to be able to sit up by the stage, uh, you know, there's, you can have pride and, and acknowledge that there's not a lot of perks that go with uh, living with a severe uh, disability in many cases, but I'll take those two any day. Thank you, John. Morgan, did you wanna go? Yes, but I'm still thinking of mine. So someone else can can go if they if they want to. I'll say something. Yeah. Um, my disability has allowed me to meet some really awesome people. I don't think I would be in the field that I'm in without my disability. May, may not, but I've, I'm connected with so many great advocates, uh, great friends. I love what I do, so and I have to contribute that some to my disability. Um, my husband also jokes that when we go back to his hometown, uh, he gets to be a cheap date because he gets in the movie theater for free for being my attendant. So there you go. <laughs> um, I I would also agree. I've I've met uh, so many new people and have had so many opportunities. Um, <laughs> and then other advantages. Um, everyone around me, their feet get cold. Mine mine do not. <laughs> um, and then I also um, have, like I said, I have prosthetics, so um, I have these, um, I don't know, I call them tattoos on my legs, like to like a cover-up kind of, so, and so I call it like a, a tattoo that didn't, didn't hurt, <laughs> so like everyone else's. Sounds good. Bev? Like a lot of autistic people, uh, pattern recognition is a big strength, uh, and it gives me a better than average chance of predicting outcomes. I cannot tell you what the lotto numbers will be, no, but in a lot of ways, uh, I have been able to, to predict things that other people didn't see. And a big piece of this is the ability to find and ask the right questions. I get really frustrated when I have an opportunity to be part of something and the main tasks have already been decided. I usually want to back up and change something uh, at the root of it, right? But uh, instead, I'm only allowed to tweak the little parts. That doesn't really work for me. Uh, I look at the bigger underneath questions. 
For example, when a child is having trouble with so-called behaviors in school, the question should not be how to get them to behave in the prescribed ways. The question should be what needs are not being met for this person and how do we address that? That's a bigger question and a bigger task requiring different resources. Nobody wants to talk about that because it doesn't fit with the system that's been built. So people keep asking the wrong questions and wonder why their solutions don't work. But the reason that it's hard and expensive to do things right isn't because that's just the way it is. It's because as a society, we've chosen to invest in control and not in humanity. So I say the ability to see these questions is autistic because people often take offense to being questioned in this way. Uh, and if we ask the hard questions, we might have to reckon with how wrong we've been and for how long. Autistic people in general are less interested in getting along and more interested in getting to the truth. This does not always make us popular. Thank you, Bev. Keith? I'm not sure that I can say anything that hasn't really been said, um, you know, outside of the, the joke of great parking. Um, I, I, I think it, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of interesting people. Um, and I, I think I've also, not specifically because of any of my individual disabilities, but just having a disability has given me a unique uh, perspective um, on the world around me and how I see things. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for, for that outcome. Great, thanks, Keith. I, you know, um, Kathy Shepard Jones asked me to not just be a moderator, but to, to speak to some of these questions. And I'll just say for me, I'm now 20 years as a CEO of three different organizations. And I think being out and open with my bipolar disorder with my staff has helped create a way for me to connect in a deeper way with my staff. And I, here at Disability Rights California, I have a number of staff who are out and open with mental health and other non-visible disabilities. Um, so I think it's a, it's a connection point for me as a manager. I think sometimes when leaders make themselves vulnerable, it also helps just reinforce the authenticity of the leadership, we don't pretend to be uh, superhuman or be able to, you know, do things that we can't do. And I feel like my depression um, sometimes is important to get me to to rest, slow down. Um, kind of, uh, I think sometimes it helps me connect with the average disabled person in a deeper way because most disabled people do not feel um, omnipotent which is how I feel sometimes when I have my high energy. So I don't know, I try, I try to see good in both, both sides, but I do think in general, being out and open with my disability has helped me be more effective as a, as a CEO in, in the nonprofit environment where I've been working. Um, and when I was in government, I felt like it helped humanize government, you know, and make, sometimes government officials can come across very bureaucratic, and I, I tried hard not to be like that when I worked in government. Um, so the, the next question, and I, this is something that I think Kathy is particularly interested in, you know, to the extent that you individually have disability pride, what are you proud about? And uh, I think Carissa touched on this. Is it possible to have pride and still struggle with your disability? Um, so uh, Carissa, do you want to go first on that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's absolutely okay to have pride in being part of this larger society that's fighting against the norms and changing things for the better for folks and still be frustrated when you have uh, maybe an awful day, pain, maybe in an, in an accessible building or we talked about that joke of parking. Uh, there comes the thing of other people in those spots or the access aisles. So that's frustrating. But you can have both of that. It's not saying you're necessarily proud of what society calls uh, the defects. 
and I hate that term, but that's what's used. But you're proud of what this group has been able to accomplish, what we're able to do as a whole, how we're able to contribute to society. And somebody said at the beginning, and I forget who it was, that if we're not out there in the workplace and in the community, then we're not able to change things. I'm proud that there are people that are able to stand up and 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 do those things and have the guts to go out there and change uh, people's minds about what disability is. So yeah, you can be struggle and still be proud. Keith, did you want to go? Yeah. Um, so I, I I think that that is where a lot of people get stuck on when we talk about disability pride um, is the idea of are you proud of your your disability like am I am I proud that I uh, live with depression or uh, chronic pain or, or anxiety um, or or panic attacks with that anxiety no absolutely not there's no joy in my chronic pain uh, necessarily um, but I do have identity because of those uh, identity with this community. Uh, and again, the opposite of shame is pride. And um, my life is not tragic. Um, so I, I do have pride in the strength and resilience and beauty of the disability community and the acceptance of disability as just being a natural part of life um, that, that is, is part of the spectrum of humans. And that uh, we we just have a different difference, and we're getting along in this world, um, you know. And, and I and and uh, in preparation, I did make a list because I wanted to be very specific about what I am proud of, um, and that includes our culture, our art, our joy, and our history. Um, so here I go. What am I proud of? Camp Jeanette, five hundred four sit-ins, the Capitol crawl. Adapt in the Gang of 19, Gallaudet and Deaf President Now protests. Nothing about us without us. Free our people. Judy Human, Justin Dart, Ed Roberts, Lois Curtis, Brad Lomax, Stella Young, and uh, Jennifer Keelan. I don't have her married last name. Climbing those steps. Um, I, we have, when you, when you peel back the layers, um, there is such a rich history of, of people fighting for our rights. And, and I do think that um, disability pride, much like many other groups, is, is a direct result of, um, of disability rights. That uh, you can't start to talk about us as a group of people who have rights without talking about us as a group of people. Um, and with that, we have our cultures, our norms, our customs, uh, and our joy. So. Beautiful. Thank you, Keith. Bev. I loved what you said, Keith. Uh, and I'm not proud of having a disability, but I am actively refusing to be ashamed of it. I'm proud, I guess, that I've survived so far. I'm proud of the autistic community for their courage in speaking out, for refusing to be crushed by a world that rejects us. I see pride as a rejection of the messages that tell us to hate ourselves. And in the process, we find connection to others who have been hurt in the same ways. And through those connections, we create communities of resistance and resilience. Pride isn't about, oh, look at all the things I can do. It, I'm just like you. Pride is a shield and it's the word no shouted over and over. It's a taking back of power. And yes, I do think you can struggle with your disability and still have pride. Pride is not about overcoming aspects of disability. I don't think it happens without the struggle. So one way to approach this is to think about the nature of these struggles. Which challenges do we have that occur strictly because of the conditions of our disability versus the impact of societal structures built and maintained without us in mind? Barriers can look like a building without ramps, and they can also look like a requirement to attend a meeting in person when remote participation would have been possible. There's no rejection quite like an invitation to a party where you can't get in the door. 
Thank you, Bev. John or Morgan, anything you all want to add? Yeah, I I really like what you said, Bev. And and for me, it's a it's it's about the the shared history that Keith mentioned, but the entitlement and privilege that we all now have as people with disabilities because of the hard work that's gone before. And when I say entitlement, I th I'm thinking of that in the sense of personal control and what I expect from society. I mean, I, I can be having a great day until I get to the Metro and the elevator's broken, or I get to a meeting and there's uh, not access to the dais where I'm supposed to give a speech. Um, here in Virginia, there was a city, or in Denver, there was a city councilman the other day who showed up for a public debate and the, the uh, debate wasn't accessible and he was expected to climb out of his wheelchair to get onto the stage. So I think we, we need to have confidence in ourselves. We need to have control over situations based on the civil rights that have been earned by those who have come before us. So there's, for me, there's a lot of pride in being able to navigate those systems, but also that refutation of those lower expectations that many in society often have for us. To say, I'm here, I deserve to be here, I belong, and I'm not going away. I, I agree with what everyone says. So I don't have, don't have anything except for um, I'm proud I'm in, in, in good health that I know of. Um, I'm proud um, that I can use my voice to to let my I can use my voice to be an advocate for um, other people with a disability because we all have voices and they deserve to be heard. So I'm just glad that I get to that I can be other people's voices that can't speak for themselves as an advocate. Great. Thank you, Morgan. I, you know, I put in the chat a link to uh, Laura Hershey's program about or a poem about disability pride called You Get Proud by Practicing. But I just wanted to read a little part of it that uh, Alice Wong excerpted on her website for the Disability Visibility Project. So this is from Laura Hershey's poem. She said, you do not need a better body, a purer spirit, or a PhD to be proud. You do not need a lot of money, a handsome boyfriend, or a nice car. You do not need to be able to walk or see or hear or use big complicated words or do any of those things that you just can't do to be proud. A caseworker cannot make you proud or a doctor. You only need more practice. You get proud by practicing. And I've, I've always felt that that was powerful. Uh, you know, for me early with my diagnosis of bipolar disorder, I was blessed to be around a lot of people with different kinds of disabilities who were proud to be part of the disability community. And they made me feel as a, as a young lawyer that I would have more impact if I was out and open with my disability and I'd be able to be, build deeper relationships with the leaders of the disability movement if I was out and open with my disability. So from, I, I really like Keith talking about some of the, the key people and the key moments in disability history that we're all connected to as disabled people. John's point that we, we inherit that legacy and we have a responsibility and an opportunity to build on that legacy. And I'm also proud of the global nature of our movement. You know, the United States was a, uh, a pioneer in some ways in framing disability as a civil rights issue. We were a pioneer in the independent living 
movement, the idea that disabled people should be in charge of our lives and in charge of the, the supports around us. Um, so I, I, I feel like that we, we've, we've had an impact around the world with how we frame disability. There's a UN convention on the rights of people with disabilities that was inspired in part by our, our laws. Um, and now the world in some ways is ahead of us. I, I feel like we can't take our legacy for granted. We're one of the only countries in the world that refuses to be a party to the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We're still having fights in California about whether people with schizophrenia should have to go in front of a court when they haven't been accused of any crime because somebody decides that they're not able to take care of themselves or make good decisions for themselves. We're fighting about conservatorship reform in California and lots of other states. So obviously the work is not done, but I, but I think we can all be proud that we're connected to a legacy and that that legacy is having a global, global impact. Um, so the, the next question is, and I think this came from Carissa, I hope I'm remembering that right. What is the difference between having disability pride and being someone's inspiration? Am I right, Carissa? Did that come from you? Yeah, uh, it did come from me. Um, I, I'm fairly young in the disability movement because a lot of my early adulthood was spent trying to change myself or fix myself. And I kind of stumbled in the uh, work that I do now. And I was introduced probably in my internship to Stella Young. Um, and I still show her some of her TED Talks to this day about uh, inspirational porn, as they call it, uh, where people use the plight of the person with the disability to actually make themselves feel better about their situation. Uh, she wanted, she says, and I still laugh at it to this day, no amount of smiling at a is going to make a ramp appear. Um, and she talks about the, the mantras of, you know, before you quit, try. You don't think we've been trying? That's using, that's using my plight to make somebody else feel better. So that's not being proud in the advocacy in, in, uh, the, the change that is using me for your own self-benefit. So that's the difference. Anything anybody wants to add to that? Um, yeah, I see them almost as opposites. By definition, inspiration benefits the receiver and not the one said to be inspiring, uh, while pride, benefits those of us who hold it, as well as other self-advocates. The disabled person as inspiration is such a trite and ableist way of looking at disability, and it's a double-edged sword. Oh, you can drive a car? You have a good job? How inspiring that is. But then the next thing you hear might be, well, obviously you don't need any kind of support because you're independent, or of course, you're not autistic the way my son, cousin, or student is. Imagine saying to somebody, oh, you're not the kind of neurotypical my best friend is. She can't even bake a good cake. These statements are analogous. The only difference is how prevalent each neurotype is. There's more of you than there are of us, so your ways must be the right ways. Pride is the ability to see through that facade and to name it. And those stories uh, about the wonderful non-disabled person who invited someone to the prom. Why is that inspiring? Should someone get a pat on the back for being nice to us? And are disabled kids supposed to think they don't deserve prom dates and friendships for the same reason as everyone else? How damaging it is to hear that any kind of kindness shown to you is out of pity or deserving of a new story. 
I come away with these from these stories with a very bad feeling. Pattern recognition informs me that this story will not result in positive action for disabled people. Not always, but often enough, it feels like a celebration of condescension. In these stories, the disabled person is not the subject, but is the object being acted upon.